Good day. My name is Johannes Buchner. I will be talking about Bayesian X-ray spectral analysis, uh, in particular the BXA package. And uh, I would just, because it's the first talk, I thought I'd just give a bit of motivation why we do X-rays in the first place. Uh, X-rays are messengers from the hot and energetic universe. So we have here on the right, for example, um, galaxy clusters where the hot gas is emitting and um, it's, it's uh, only visible in the X-rays in the mission. And on the left, we have compact objects like uh, supermassive black holes, which we cannot reproduce in the laboratory. And they are very interesting systems to study. And X-rays allows us to do that. Um, just in general, the science questions we typically have, here I divided them in two categories. Um, for example, you might be interested in some parameter of interest, for example, luminosity, column density, temperature, some parameter of a model. And you want to say, make a statement that with high probability, the true value out there in the universe lies between A and B, or you might want to say, oh, it cannot be above B, otherwise the data would be very different. And the second type of science question we have is we want to distinguish uh, different uh, processes um, or, for example, Compton upscattering versus branch Stahlung or something like that. Or we want to test for additional absorption emission or cutoff features, something like that. Um, so that would be comparing models. And another aspect of this is checking whether one particular model uh, can actually explain the data. Uh, here, I just want to give a bit of a uh, brief story of how we tell ourselves the observations are done. And I'll talk in particular about X-ray spectra from a point source, but uh, many of these concepts can be transferred to other data, like timing and, uh, and imaging. So on the left, you have your astrophysical source with, with its source spectrum. The X-ray photons enter the uh, mirror modules of the telescope uh, twice reflected and focused on the detector, where they are transformed into an electron cloud, um, where uh, and and count become counts in energy channels. And we can model this whole procedure by projecting through a response matrix. One is an, an example shown on the top right here. Um, and you see it's not a diagonal matrix, so we cannot invert this process to infer the source spectrum. We have to forward fold and um, to, to estimate the counts expected on the detector. So uh, if we do this linear approximation, uh, basically you assume some source spectrum, you assume you know your instrument, you, you additionally have some background emission coming in, and you can simulate uh, what you would expect, how many counts you would get. And then you can make a Poisson uh, realization of that to compare to your actual data. Just to remind you about uh, count data, uh, here is the Poisson distribution formula and plotted on the right. Um, the counts are integers uh, and, and they cannot be negative. So, uh, and you see from the distribution that it's not a symmetric distribution. So if you use Gaussians, um, they will lead to biases um, uh, in, in the low count regime for sure. Uh, I remind you also that if you take this Poisson likelihood that I just showed you and you apply this trick of taking the logarithm and multiplying by minus two, you get um, this, this formula here, which is known as CSTAT or cash statistics, uh, depending on, on what constants you drop. Uh, if you do the same with the Gaussian uh, likelihood, you get what's called chi-square. Uh, this doesn't mean anything except saying, oh, we assume a Poisson uh, data process or a Gaussian data process. If you have multiple bins, you project this through. Uh, as I said, your flux uh, spectrum, you project it through your response and you get the number of counts you expect in each energy channel. And you, you sum up your statistic and um, that gives you your likelihood. So we've, we've, we've established this forward folding that gives you the probability to produce some data, assuming all of this process, uh, assuming a source spectrum, instrument model, and so forth. Um, and that we will casually call the like likelihood. But what we actually want is the probability distribution of the source spectrum parameters. So we want the probability distribution over the parameter space, not over the data space. 
And we want to identify those regions and those parameters which have high probability. And nobody knows how to do this from scratch, but we know the next best thing, which is Bayesian inference. Uh, and I'm sure you, many of you have, or most of you have heard about it. Uh, I'll just keep it brief. Basically the idea is to start with the probability distribution called the prior, um, prior distribution. So that's already a probability distribution over the parameters. And you update it with the likelihood function, which is not a probability distribution over the parameters. You update it and on the left, you get the posterior distribution. And uh, you see here on the bottom left, an example of such a probability distribution. And you look at where most of the probability is and that uh, allows you to answer some interesting science questions. Uh, the term on the bottom right in this equation is um, called the evidence. It normalizes the posterior. It's sort of the average likelihood over the parameter space. Um, and it can be used for model comparison that I will get to later. So you can do this. You can um, make grids in your parameters and you can do uh, Bayesian inference and everything's great except uh, in real life, it's a little bit more complicated. So parameter spaces like the ones shown here on the left uh, can have these weird banana shapes where they have multiple peaks. They can have odd tails. And that's important if you want to put 99% uh, uh, limits on something. And they can be high dimensional, by which I mean you have 5, 10, 20 parameters uh, that you want to constrain. And at the same time, we're getting into an era where we have many sources, a large number of sources from surveys, from the X-ray archives. And even if you don't have many sources that you want to analyze, you might have one particular source, but many models that you want to contrast. Uh, and if you want to do this in reproducible science, you want, you want to use some robust algorithm that deals with these complications uh, that I mentioned. Uh, so some global algorithm that, that allows you to automate this process. And here I'll be talking about nested sampling, which, which does address these, these problems. And uh, if you're familiar with Markov chain Monte Carlo and CMC, uh, it basically jumps around in this parameter space and the visits uh, sort of give you the, uh, the, prob the probability distribution. So you basically build a histogram in these vertical slices. But nested sampling works sort of the other way around. It makes horizontal slices. Um, so you try um, in each iteration to build one of these Lebesgue slices and uh, compute the height of the slice, which is the likelihood and the width or the volume of this accessible parameter space um, uh, at the same time. And the, the integration over these slices uh, is then the integral, the, the evidence, and the importance of each shell gives you the posterior probability distributions. So how does the algorithm work? Uh, basically, imagine your parameter space is two-dimensional, like shown here on the left. You throw in 200 points, and you find the one that gives you the worst fit, and you take that one out. And you have to imagine the volume represented by these points now shrank by a factor of 1 over 200. And now, um, you put another point in, drawn again uniformly according to the prior distribution, uh, but with the constraint that the fit has to be better than the one you just took out. So, and if it doesn't, you, you repeat the process. And if you do this iteratively, every, in every iteration, the volume shrinks by a constant factor, one over 200. So you are, we are keeping track of the volume that is accessible and you have access to the likelihood, the height of each of, each of these slices uh, by the likelihood that you just removed. And if, as you iterate and iterate, you always take out the worst fit. And so in, you end up in a situation where uh, all the points are concentrated at the best fit or near the best fit in a very tiny read, uh, volume. And then you can stop because your inter, uh, that tiny volume doesn't contribute to your integration anymore. Now, the missing piece here is how to draw this unif uniformly distributed random point, uh, but with this likelihood threshold. And uh, just like in MCMC, you have to put in some transition kernel in nested sampling, you have to put in that, uh, that process for this likelihood restricted prior sampling. But the nice thing is about nested sampling is that uh, there are general solutions here. Um, basically, there are two big classes, uh, some random walk algorithms, 
and the class that I will talk about are um, those that uh, use the existing points to find a neighborhood region and only sample, sample from that neighborhood region. And uh, quite famous is Fontenest, which clusters the existing points with, an, an, uh, with a clustering algorithm into ellipsoids um, and uses some a bit more ad hoc criteria to split these clusters. Um, and um, I will mostly be talking about ML friends, which is another algorithm which doesn't use uh, this kind of ad hoc clustering, but uh, builds ellipsoids around each point and then cross validates leaving some points out to make sure that the region built is robust and you have some safety guarantees. And so this is a bit more uh, well motivated, less ad hoc algorithm to use as nested sampling and it's and, but both of these algorithms work really well in practice and um, give usable results um, with realistic models. There's a review and there's some animation that you can check out how the algorithm pro process progresses. Um, but let me just come to BXA. So what is BXA? Well, it connects one of these uh, inference engines that is very robust based on this sampling with a fully fledged fitting environment, which has community developed legacy models and, and new models that come in um, and the established data formats. Um, and you, for example, Sherpa and PyExpec can be connected with BXA to Multinest or Ultranest in the latest versions. And that's just a hundred lines of code in essence. Of course, now it does a little bit more um, like background models and visualization tools. But the point is what is really enabled by this. And what is enabled is that you can ver do very sophisticated analyses and get very interesting results on the probability distributions. And I'll show you some examples. So basically you can fit any model and data supported by whatever fitting environment you use, as long as you define your priors and you get posterior probabilities and the evidence for model comparison. You don't need to define a starting point. You don't need minimal number of counts and don't, you don't need to rebin your data for that. I'll just show an example here for the, uh, for the low data count uh, uh, case. So here I'm uh, simulating uh, Chandra spectrum of a heavily obscured AGN. So it's a, a absorbed power law and some additional uh, Compton scattering in green and an additional soft component in purple. And what I'll do is I keep this uh, the spectrum, spectral shape the same that I used to generate, but I'll make it fainter and fainter. And on the right, you will see uh, the parameter constraints on the obscuration and luminosity. So initially, all of that probability uh, in the posterior samples is very well concentrated, but as you become fainter and fainter, lower and lower counts, this uh, expands and at some point you even have two modes, two solutions here. But even if you have zero counts, uh, you still learn something, namely at the bottom right quarter of this um, plot is always excluded because otherwise in the bottom right you would have a luminous unobscured or less obscured AGN and that you can exclude already with your low count data. So there's no limit here. Um, BXA also includes empirical background models for a wide, wide variety of uh, missions uh, shown here that we developed in Simmons et al. Uh, using a machine learning method. We basically uh, did a PCA analysis on um, archival data and it's quite neat to use these because you get more uh, signal to noise or you get more signal out because you, you put in more information about what your background is supposed to be. And one example application here is X-ray redshifts. We, uh, in, the, in the deepest Chandra observations in the Chandra deep field south, it's quite difficult to find the redshifts of active galactic nuclei um, because the exposures are so faint. There are so many possible counterparts in these, uh, in these deep surveys that you could assign uh, that source to. Uh, and furthermore, it's difficult, even if you find the right counterpart, it's difficult to get uh, uh, optical spectroscopy to measure the redshift. So it would be neat to get those out of the X-rays directly. And what you'll see, what you see here um, in this plot is the source spectrum. And you see a bit of a clump here 
which actually corresponds to the iron K line um, at a redshift of 0 0.7. And on the, on the right, you see a less obscured case of another Compton thick AGM, like on the left, uh, a less obscured case. And you see some wiggles here, but it's very difficult to tell by eye what is instrumental wiggles and what is, um, what is absorption edges that you could also use for redshift. But if you put all of this into BXA and use a sensible X-ray obscure model, you get the posterior distributions here on the left. And indeed, you can constrain the uh, redshifts to the true spectroscopic values. And uh, here in the Bayesian inference, I, I didn't have to do anything specific about uh, each instrument, whereas in the classical analysis, you would have to tune thresholds for each uh, particular instrument you analyze here. Uh, once you have these posterior distributions, uh, you might want to go further to sample distributions. For example, here on the left, you have some uh, parameter and uh, at each epoch of your object or for many objects, you have these probability distributions and you want to infer what is the intrinsic uh, distribution uh, incorporating all these uh, uncertainties. And there is a very neat uh, technique to do that. I think there is a lightning talk on that. Um, called uh, hierarchical Bayesian models. And uh, the neat thing about it is it, it adding additional uh, less constrained objects doesn't wash out your signal and it incorporates all that uncertainty. And we have a, um, an implementation called posterior stacker that, that does this and produces uh, plots like on the bottom right here, you get the intrinsic or the, the sample distribution out. Um, uh, and it can ingest outputs from BXA or whatever analysis you've, you, MCMC or whatever analysis you've done before. And here is show some examples. On the top left, you have gamma ray burst uh, obscuration uh, distribution, so column density um, fitted with a couple of sample distributions like the Gaussian. Um, if you just look at the mean of this Gaussian, um, you could also divide these kind of samples up and look how the mean behaves in these different subsamples. And this is what Baroncelli et al. Uh, did on the top right here for the reflection um, in sort of intensity um, for the narrow in blue and uh, in red for the broad relativistic lines. And uh, uh, what uh, Baroncelli found here is that for both, there, there seems to be an effect with luminosity. Um, on the bottom right is an, a, a similar analysis for the obscuration fraction as a, as a function of orientation of the uh, AGM. So very interesting uh, analysis you can do here. I want to also highlight Erosita, where recently we've released the EFETS field with 22,000 AGM in there, uh, which we've analyzed with eight models. So you can imagine the computational complexity and you really need a good inference uh, machine that can do can deal with this. Um, so we have the X-ray spectra in blue here, get probability distribution for each model. And then you want to do sample distributions like shown here on the bottom right, you get the column density distribution of that particular sample and the photolimits distribution on the top right. Now I want to talk a bit about model comparison. Uh, for model comparison, uh, it's always important to keep in mind what question you're asking. So if you have, for example, just empirical models that try to approximate the shape uh, of, or the effective behavior of your data, then you might want to uh, just look for the model that uh, has enough um, capability to store the information contained in your data. So you want to do something information theory based or you might want to pick a model based on how well it extrapolates to data it hasn't seen. That's very common in machine learning, so the prediction quality. But if you have models that are um, that, that dif differ in physical scenarios, um, often in these cases, you have uh, well-justified priors for all of the parameters, and uh, you can do Bayesian model comparison with the evidence and base factors. And that's what we did in 2014. On the bottom right, I show different obscure geometries that are plausible. And we were able to uh, distinguish between these uh, uh, different physical scenarios using uh, model comparison. And just to illustrate how that works, um, let's say you have one model 
um, that is relatively inflexible, like illustrated in the middle uh, here, and two can just make some uh, more or less line shapes, and it sort of fits your data reasonably well, um, but in, in some region of its parameter space. But if you include also another model, which is much more flexible, like the one here on the left, so you can make all kinds of uh, twisted shapes, then you will of course find a better fit, uh, higher likelihood, but it will be in a very small volume of this parameter space because as soon as you move away, the model has to do something very different because it's very flexible, it will make a different shape. And so the multiplication of likelihood and volume will be uh, lower because the volume is so small. And uh, in other words, this prediction diversity this unused uh, prediction capability is being punished uh, by this averaged likelihood, marginal likelihood. And so you can do this uh, integral ratios, uh, Z1 over Z2 here is the base factor. If you multiply that by a model prior odds ratio, you get a posterior odds ratio, which, which tells you the probability of model one compared to the probability of model two. Um, the, uh, the drawbacks here are that you need these model priors, um, either you, you have a good idea for them. Um, and the second issue is just because one model has a higher uh, evidence value, that doesn't, and you, you decide to say, okay, this is my true model, I'm gonna pick that one. It doesn't tell you the, ratio, the, the rate at which you would make a false decision. Three so, minutes. Uh, what I would, yep. So what I would recommend is uh, to always make uh, simulations. Uh, so you generate a bunch of data on the one model and on the other model, and you, you, you try out how often you would make a false decision. So that allows you to get um, uh, base factor thresholds. And the, the nice thing about this is then you have the best of both worlds. Um, so basically, so here's an example from, uh, from, from one paper where we also showed that this works better than likelihood ratios. The advantages here is you, you get rid of the parameter prior dependencies. You have these frequentist properties on some Bayesian methods, so you, you know how often you would be wrong, uh, but you still retain this inter interpretability of the base factors and, and uh, the, the, the consistent Bayesian application. The disadvantages is it's computationally expensive um, but with nested sampling is actually feasible. I think I said that. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of styles to do model comparison. Um, if you just want to test the model in isolation, you probably want to do posterior predictive checks or uh, parameter bootstrap. If you have competing models, it depends whether, as I said, whether they're empirical um, or whether they are more physically motivated. If they are nested, if you have additive components, maybe you just want to estimate the strength of that additional component and you can just do parameter estimation uh, or you can do a Bayesian model comparison. So just so I will just finish with some practical advice. You can do a good Bayesian inference with any package. Some make it easier than others. Um, it's important to state what you're doing. Um, I would recommend to always use Poisson statistics because the reasons to use uh, Gaussian statistics are basically lie in the numerics and in the optimizers, and we have better tools now, so no reason to use those. Uh, not everything has to be a test, so visualizations are important. Vary your assumptions and priors, do a lot of simulations. And there are some uh, groups uh, available to ask for help, and you can open issues on GitHub. And on that point, BXA is a software package that is open source developed. It allows robust inference within environments that you're already familiar with. Um, it's community developed. Please contribute and report bugs. It's currently lacking a bit on the visual, visualizations end. So if you, if you want to contribute there, that would be an awesome way to start. Uh, we have some tools uh, that are sort of turnkey for fitting AGM. Uh, heavily obscured AGM or mildly obscured AGM. And you, you could develop your own tool for your own uh, science case and process the, the archives. And uh, we'll have a tutorial on BXA in August, uh, as, as was said, with uh, end of August uh, with Peter Borman.
Uh, yeah, there's some additional resources uh, of previous workshops, and there's an uh, awesome uh, X ray primer on uh, the CXC website. So thanks for that, and uh, let's stop here and uh, take your questions. <laughs>